Sorry. Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Women in Data Scientist Fireside events. I'm Shi Jin Feng. Um, I will introduce the background of the women uh, in data scientist community. Women in data scientist community uh, was started as, um, as a workshop in the uh, Microsoft uh, Machine Learning and Data Scientist Conference in early of 2018. Since then, we have hosted community events, uh, machine learning conference workshops, and we have ongoing uh, mentorship matching program. Right now, the community has more than 800 active members. Our mission is empower women in the data field to uh, achieve their full potential. Uh, for any of the past events and the um, upcoming events, pre-join our groups. Um, what does being a data scientist leader like? And what are their unique journey? What can we learn from their experience? Today, we are very excited to invite three uh, distinguished women leaders in the field. Uh, Aaron Manavokru, the Vice President of the Microsoft Search Ads. Alan uh, leads the uh, organization of developers, PMs, and data scientists across multiple countries. Prior to joining Microsoft, she was the research scientist at Yahoo. Casey Tanimura is the uh, vice president of analytics and data science at Summit Partners, a growth equity, uh, equity firm in San Francisco. Casey um, has built and lead a data team across multiple industries and companies. She's also the author of SQL for Data Analytics. And our moderator today is Yang Guo, the principal group uh, engineering manager at Microsoft Outlook Data Platform team. Yang leads the uh, teams of engineers and data scientists across six countries. She has the success record of driving and accelerating business innovation through data. Prior to joining Outlook, she was in the uh, Microsoft Cortana uh, Bing team, as well as work at um, Amazon in the Kindles. All right, uh, next slide, please. Um, so during the event, please feel free to uh, type your questions in the live chat uh, section, and the speakers will take the questions towards the end. All right, without further ado, I will pass to Yan for our exciting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Xi Jing, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Depends on the time zone you are. Thank you very much for having me, and it's really great to be here in this Women in Data Science community. Uh, as Xi Jing mentioned, I'm Yan Guo. I'm leading the Outlook Data Platform team. Uh, our team is a multidisciplinary team with engineers, data science, and applied scientists. Our mission is to deliver value with data by providing and democratizing trustworthy privacy compliance and curated data sets that power insights, intelligent, and rapid experimentation in the product development lifecycle for billions of M365 users. A fun fact about my team, we are a team with team members then across three continents and seven different countries. So now I'm heading over to uh, Aaron and Kathy. Maybe Aaron and Kathy, if you don't mind, you can introduce yourself a little bit more and also maybe share with us your most memorable moment during the summer. Aaron, do you want to start? Sure. I'm Aaron, and as uh, Xi Jing already introduced me, I am the vice president of Microsoft Search Ads. This means I am responsible for everything about the search ad space, meaning you know product development, algorithms, um, everything that goes from deep learning to reinforcement learning to uh, then product feature development. Um, so I've been at Microsoft for about 10 years. Um, I will stop here because I have a feeling I'll go into much more details later on. Fun fact about myself or for the summer. I think the most memorable moment for me this summer was that when I visited Turkey, uh, my best friend had just published her first book and I went into various different bookstores and uh, you know bought her book every time I saw it. That was really fun for me. 
Hi, um, thanks so much for having me here. Um, Kathy Tanimura, um, Chi Jing did a great introduction um, that I, um, VP of Analytics and Data Science at Summit Partners, with the, which is a growth equity firm. So we invest in companies, help them um, grow and uh, accelerate their development. Um, so I wear a few different hats. I work quite a lot with our portfolio companies, advising them across the range of their data journey. I do some work with our investing teams, helping them to assess companies and decide whether to invest. And then I do some work on an internal product we develop around sourcing deals. Um, so I get to kind of keep my fingers on keyboard and skills sharp around that. And uh, prior to Summit, I've been at a number of different high growth startup companies. So seen a lot of different industries, a lot of different teams and products and uh, still love working with data every day. Um, oh, I guess this summer, um, for the first time, I took my son on a cross-country trip. So we flew out to Boston to, I was going to a conference and he went to stay with my brother. So he's 12. This was our first sort of one-on-one -on -one trip. It was um, quite a journey. We we held each other up through <laughs> the stresses of, of summer travel, but it was a great experience. Sounds great. And thank you for both of you. And it's great to, to have both of you over here. Um, let's dive into some of the questions. So we pre-selected a bunch of questions from our community. Uh, keep in mind that our community, uh, majority of our members is actually in their mid career, our kind of medium uh, early career uh, stage. Uh, so they actually had the great questions uh, in terms of like a career journeys and they would like to get recommendations from both of you. Uh, so one of my favorite questions that <laughs> a little bit biased uh, looking at it really uh, how to look for opportunities and then take on it to accelerate your career and how do you minimize the risk that knowing it's red opportunity or maybe it's not a red opportunity. So maybe Erin, given that you have been Microsoft for almost 10 years, you can share your insights and uh, you know some of the experience that you had been. Sure, so I'll start by saying like something you said early on really resonated with me is that everybody has their own unique path to wherever they are. I, I myself never have been someone who thought of, you know, even today thinks about where will I be in five years? Where do I want to be in three years? It's never been like that for me. It's always been, am I liking what I'm doing? Do I want to continue on this you know, path? Do I want to make any changes? And if so, what are those type of changes? I'm also a little bit on the emotional side. Like for me, it really matters that I enjoy, you know, coming to work. If I'm coming to work or even if I'm at home, you know, working with the people I work with and working on the problems that I work on. Like I personally am really into looking at the data and figuring out what's wrong and what problems can we solve for real users and real advertisers that matters um, to them. As long as these things are satisfied that I'm technically working on a technically, in, you know, uh, intriguing problem, challenging problem, and I'm working with good people, I'll be happy and satisfied. Uh, but of course, uh, definitely over time, you know, it, it, I'll just tell you how my growth has happened. I believe the reason why I ended up kind of uh, being where I am is uh, primarily because I took some of these challenges and some of the opportunities that came, you know, my way. Even if it was in an area where I previously did not have any experience, and I'll give you an example. Like when my background is on applications of machine learning, I did not have any uh, you know, education on economics or game theory that relate to how you run auctions, for instance. Uh, but of course, being in the advertising space for a long time, you know, you learn things on the job and I learned things on the job and, you know, opportunity came up uh, with respect to leading this team of, you know, very skilled and way more qualified people than I. I was all up for it. I thought, hey, this is great. I'll learn. I'll figure out if I like this area and let's see what happens. So I guess if there is any advice I could give, it would be two things. You know, one, 
really, you know, in order to take up something new, you don't need to be already an expert in that area, but you need to know what you don't know and you need to be able to utilize other people around you and other experts around you. I think this is this is one skill set that I really think everybody needs, right? You're not going to be the expert on everything you lead if you are leading a large enough team. You need to be able to hire the right type of people, work with people who have complementary skills to you and try things out. Don't be afraid. What is the worst thing that can happen? You know, failure is part of, you know, the learning process, even if you fail at the first idea you have. So that's been my attitude. And I think I like surrounding myself with, again, people who I think know more than I do so that I have a support system when I have an idea. Someone can tell me, hey, this is probably not the best thing to do. If uh, I have blind sides and I do, they can point those out to me and I can, you know, work with them to uh, solve whatever challenging, interesting problems, you know, we are working on. And then again, the second part is really everybody is different. I mean, I, I work with a lot of great people and colleagues who do have plans unlike me, um, but I don't and that works for me. So, you know, this has been, I think, my path and Kathy, let's see if your experience has been any different. Yeah, I think um, uh, similar to Aaron, I haven't had necessarily a specific plan in mind and it's always when you look backwards at your career, it looks more linear and like it makes more sense when you're looking backwards. But, you know, as I went along, it was always uh, trying to stay in touch with um, you know, am I still interested in what I'm doing? Am I excited? Do I feel like I'm learning something new at least every week? Um, do I feel like I have more to contribute to what I'm doing? And when, you know, when I've gotten to the point where I feel stagnant or like I'm not, you know, kind of learning or, or kind of at the peak of my capabilities, you know, maybe it's time to look at something else. Um, and so I've done that for me. It's been uh, moving between different companies, which I know is maybe different from a lot of folks um, inside of Microsoft. I've tended to work at smaller companies where, you know, I was the data person building the team. Um, and so, you know, I'd say in terms of looking at new opportunities and evaluating them, I think whether you're within one company or between companies, it's always, you know, what am I going to learn? Uh, do I know, you know, enough about this to have a toehold, but is there enough, uh, you know, kind of big opportunity in front of me that I'm going to stay excited in this role for at least a several, you know, at least several years? Um, you know, in terms of kind of finding the opportunities, um, I would say, you know, talk to people and let them know you're interested. Um, this can be your manager. Um, and there's definitely kind of an art here, you know, going in and saying, you know, when am I going to get promoted? When am I get promoted? Doesn't go over as well as the I'm interested in this thing. Keep me in mind if there are opportunities. I'm interested in managing people or I'm interested in exposure to, you know, this other part of the business or whatever it is. Um, also, your peers and other people that you talk to, um, you know, letting them know that you find what they do interesting or that you'd like to learn more about something uh, somewhere else. Uh, you know, a lot of opportunities get um, kind of turfed up through other people. Um, so just kind of having those networks and, you know, just organically, you know, it doesn't have to be overly forced, um, but those things tend to turn up, um, you know, interesting opportunities over time. Um, and then one other thing I'll say about, you know, picking opportunities and finding ones that are going to be good for you is, beyond the what am I going to learn in this uh, new role is who am I going to work with? Um, you know, we all like to work with people that we like, so that's always good. But also, you know, are there people who will challenge us, um, challenge our thinking, expose us to new ideas or ways of working or, uh, you know, totally different disciplines? You know, all of that is is really useful as you think about building out your career and, and you know, building out your kind of skills and capabilities. 
Yeah, thank you, Erin and Kathy. Um, it really recognized me the three points I think both of you actually mentioned. Uh, the number one is really, you know, all opportunity to treat as a learning opportunity. If you think that, you know, this opportunity actually can help you to grow and really help with your curiosity and trying to learn different, you know, either domain area or different uh, technique is a good opportunity. So that's what I get. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. And I think the second one that my takeaway is really the people is really important uh, that around you. So they could be a very positive energy. And even though sometimes, you know, there's ups and downs, uh, you can still have that trust towards a, you know, uh, relationship and help you and give you the honest uh, advice or honest recommendations. So I think both of you actually touch that as well, not just the projects you're working on, but really, you know, the people around you uh, to influence you and help you. And the third one, I think uh, Kathy mentioned about, you know, the opportunity is great that we're, uh, you know, people create opportunity for us, but at the same time, we should also um, proactively, proactively let other people know what are interesting to us, what we would like to learn. So maybe, you know, other people can also keep in mind the next opportunity coming over. And, uh, you know, they actually uh, do create opportunity for you because they already know your interest. But sometimes I think, especially towards women, we don't always kind of ask for things and we're all kind of, you know, just waiting for the opportunity to come to us. So those are really great, uh, I think, uh, insights you, you two shared. I think some of the, what you have is actually attached to the next question. Uh, some a lot, a lot of people would like to ask you: uh, What are the, some key skills you worked on when transition to a lead, like from IC to a lead? Um, what are the skills that uh, you feel like are are really important for you when you're kind of transitioning roles or uh, transitioning from an IC to a manager role? Maybe, Kathy, you can start this time. Sure. Yeah, I think um, communication is one that has been a, you know, just constant uh, theme, I guess, for me. I'm a pretty introverted person, so the idea of, you know, talking and communicating a whole lot, it, you know, it takes some work. Um, you know, there's both the communicating to people that are now on your team about, what the work is, how to break it out, why it's important, but also the communication kind of laterally to your peers and other teams that you work with, and then you know up the chain of command. Um, what's the progress? What are the blocking points? When will things be done? Why is the work that the team is doing important? Um, you know, all of that was kind of a new, you know, new thing to exercise. Um, and, and really important in, in kind of being successful in that kind of a role. Um, I think the other part was some of the project management and project planning. Um, you know, how long is this going to take? I have no idea. I used to just sit down and, you know, start working on it. Um, but when you're in a lead, you're often kind of coordinating your piece of the puzzle amongst other pieces. and you know, trying to develop ways to estimate work and um, take estimates from other people and figure out how that plays in have been, uh, you know, kind of constant. It's in neither of my necessarily my strong points, but, uh, you know, it's like anything you go to the gym and you work it out and <laughs> you, you develop those muscles and get better over time. All right, I think Kathy touched on a few things that are really common, and I think for a lot of people, myself included, but also people I see around me, this uh, communication part is really uh, key. And what I mean by that is you need to be very clear. You know, you'll hear about these cliche sounding words like creating clarity, but this part is very true. When you're responsible for a team, when you're responsible for a product, you need to be very clear about what your expectations are, what the objectives are, and how each and every person on that team fits into that plan. It's important for individuals who you are leading to understand how they connect to the big picture, what is their impact. And it's also very clear that they know the timelines, they know, you know, what 
the expectation is of them. Both of these pieces are highly critical. In my personally, I think uh, for me, one of the other biggest, uh, maybe the first adjustment I needed to make going from an IC to a lead and a manager, especially a manager of more than, say, two or three people, it was, um, you know, this balance between, yeah, you know, there are things that you can do yourself for sure. <laughs> and, you know, if if you have a team of 10 people or so, you still have some time to, you know, do the dev work yourself. In my case, it was, you know, modeling data analysis, all of the fun stuff that I miss a lot. Uh, but, um, but then there's, of course, the other part, which is you need to train your you know, team, you need to train the people you are working with as well. They need to start taking, you know, over some of the things that you do or you used to do. And this is not necessarily always an issue with control, but it may become a challenge if, again, you know, you are not so sure about this coordination piece, the timing piece of things. It's just not that you don't trust the people to, you know, maybe finish a job, but is it going to be done in a timely manner? You know, this is one piece where I see a lot of strong ICs in particular having some difficulty with like, OK, you know, there is this delivery thing I want to deliver quickly. I want to finish something quickly, but at the same time, you know, we do need to uh, train other people and we need to make sure that others are actually, you know, on the same boat. So that part to me was certainly one of the <laughs> Uh, pieces that require some adjustment. I initially viewed my role as I need to not just, you know, communicate clearly what we need to do and perhaps, you know, plan it at a high level, but also unblock my team. This was the way I kind of thought about, the, uh, you know, problems, but I have to admit there was a period where I, for some tasks, um, especially when you actually inherit people, I, I don't think this gets discussed much in reality, but in, especially if you stay in a company for a while, you don't just end up managing people you've worked with already. Sometimes you also just inherit people and there might be high uncertainty. I mean, I have to admit early on, I, you know, even though I'd given, uh, you know, certain uh, tasks to others and I was training other people, there were times where I did some things in parallel without necessarily letting everyone know that I was already doing it. But I wanted to have this kind of, okay, I'll, you know, reduce my risk a little bit so that I have something in the background in case something bad happens. But you have to invest in, in the team. You have to basically sometimes you know, not sometimes, uh, most of the time, think about this as a long-term optimization. That's the way I, you know, talk about it now. Investing in your team and training your team is actually longer-term investment in the product itself. Uh, so that's, yeah, another thing that I see as a common, uh, somewhat common you know, adjustment uh, early on um, f going from IC to a management position. Later on, another thing that becomes important, especially if you are in a company like, you know, Microsoft, it's a big company. You work with a lot of different teams. I don't know, Jan, what your experience has been, but, you know, I found myself in places and I've heard this also from, you know, people on my team that sometimes they feel, you know, the two teams objectives may not be the same necessarily. You know, if they are not necessarily aligned in terms of, what, uh, you know, what we are trying to move, what we are trying to accomplish. There might be times where there is this, you know, some kind of friction in terms of, okay, how do I make things move, if, you know, move? How do I work together with different teams? I think the most critical thing also for, you know, leads and managers is to first, give everyone uh, the benefit of doubt that <laughs> if you're in the same company that everybody actually wants to do the right thing and, you know, recognize that there could be differences in objective, slight differences. You do need to work together. You also need to make sure the other team realizes you are in it to also you know, accomplish the goals that they are trying to accomplish. I mean, it's easier said than done, but having that, you know, mindset, like immediate thought you would have otherwise might be, why are these people not, you know, not seeing what we need to do here? Like, are they not wanting to help us? That's not 
the thing most of the time. Most of the time, you just need to figure out how to actually get to a point where you know both sets of goals are uh, accomplished. Yeah, those are all great uh, suggestions and also uh, insights. Um, I remember um, one of my mentors used to um, to told me when I just became a manager. Uh, he said that um, Yen, uh, I know you're a very capable, um, but when you start managing the team, uh, you know your team is going. You know some members might be, uh, you know, failing in terms of some projects. And even though you know, you still needed to let them to learn, to fail, and then to improve. And don't just take on, you know, all those work that they are doing and uh, get yourself, you know, because you know yourself going to do it very quickly and faster. But be a manager, one of the key things is to actually coaching your team. And you know, as you both of you mentioned about, really help grow others so that we have that uh, exponential, you know, compounding effect as a high performer team. So that's really great. And then the other thing that I think it both of you touch on is really the communication. Uh, I think the communication is the key skills everywhere, not just, you know, I see not just the, a manager, right? So as I see, especially that you become a very senior tech lead, you needed to collaborate and also partner across different organizations to really drive that uh, clarity and make sure that the team align on the same goal and communicate effectively and also efficiently are very crucial uh, for all of us. And to be honest, I'm also still learning, you know, start from managing a small team and now a big team and different ways of communication. And also really depends on the audience, whether you're interacted with your team member, your peers, our executive. So sometimes we have to adjust ourselves in terms of the communication style on that. So those are very, very valuable. I don't know if um, Kathy, do you have anything additional to add on? <laughs> Um, I will just reiterate that um, letting go and delegating and teaching other people how to do things and then realizing they may do them differently from you. And you hear a lot when you're younger in your career, this idea of you should always hire people who are smarter than you. And it, it took me a while to really appreciate that fully, but I have had times where I, you know, I have said, hey, you know, here's this thing we need to do. Here's how I might approach it. And then the person on my team takes it and runs with it in a totally different direction and creates something that's way better than I would have ever thought of or ever been able to accomplish. And there's a, you know, I feel like that's how you you know that you've done something good and, and you get that sort of special warm feeling that like, hey, uh, you know, magic is happening because, you know, I'm I'm giving the right information and the right context and then, uh, you know, letting go and, and trusting the person on my team to, you know, do the right thing and, and create great work. And, you know, finding that space to let go has really been uh, critical, I think. So definitely agree with that. Yeah, that, those are great. Thank you. Um, I do think that we have some actually community members, uh, you know, instead of uh, uh, pursuing managerial role, they would like to stay on IC. Um, so some of them are wondering, like, you know, in the bigger company, Microsoft, how are you going to consistently grow your career when you are technical IC? So I don't know if Erin, you have some suggestions and advice to, to those the members. I will say that there is absolutely a path for highly technical uh, ICs. You don't need to be a manager in order to grow, even at Microsoft. This is a question I get very frequently, and I try to encourage some of our you know, highly technical ICs to stay as technical ICs instead of switching to you know, management uh, you know, role. There has been occasions you know, where I've maybe also encourage some people to become managers, but really it is not a necessity at all to become a manager to grow in this in this company. I mean, if you actually look around, you will see very uh, highly technical distinguished engineers and tech fellows. Um, I mean, that's the area that I mostly, for, you know, I, I'm more aware of because clearly my background is on, on the dev side, but um, there is no uh, shortage of this, actually. You can be highly 
technical um, and continue as an individual contributor, I see two paths in general. Um, you can go really deep in an area or you can be a little bit more of a generalist. Now, these are not, um, you know, zero or one. <laughs> so of course, you know, there is all sorts of, uh, you know, gradients of this. But um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it is true that as you grow in your career, say you've become a principal, then you're, you know, in, in Microsoft terminology, you've become a partner. One of the things that, you know, obviously uh, becomes important in sort of, you know, uh, in how you are evaluated is also how you influence others. Um, and you could imagine that influence is difficult to do if you're not a manager, but I would disagree with that. Influence is more than possible as an expert in an area if you are the, you know, clear domain expert in a particular area. If you have the depth, you can, you know, initiate a lot of interesting and ambitious projects. A lot of people could come to you for, you know, consultants and just seek your opinion. Influence should not be literally interpreted as just, you know, if how many people can I tell what to do? That's not the case. And anyway, that's not how managers are supposed to be, you know, managing either. So don't be afraid of, uh, you know, uh, staying as an IC. I personally feel like it's, uh, if I did this again, maybe in a different universe, I would certainly have followed an IC path. I would have liked to do that. Like, you know, for me, the decision to, you know, choose the management, I would say it's more accidental than intentional. I mean, in the end, of course, I enjoy parts of it too, but I could easily see myself as a technical IC and I would have easily, you know, I would have had as much fun and I think as much influence and I, you know, this to me is really critical for this audience to know that it is not just possible, it is also encouraged. That's great. Thank you, Erin. Um, Kathy, any insights from you from a smaller company? Sure, yeah. I think, you know, a lot of organizations have struggled a bit with how to have really compelling, very senior roles for people who are technical and not managing people. But I think that's changing and a lot more people and organizations are realizing that you should be able to foster very senior, very technical people because they, you know, frankly add a lot to the organization. I think in my own path, I've uh, kind of bounced back and forth between almost like purely management roles and, you know, hands on doing coding work. and the latest role that I took at Summit Partners, I kind of intentionally picked it because I do get the opportunity to do some hands-on work, which I just love. You know, like that's my happy part of the day when I'm digging around in the data. Um, but I also like the parts about um, influencing people and advising people and, you know, and trying to find that sweet spot has been part of my career journey. I would say, you know, I think Erin touched on this, um, but the, you know, as you become more senior, you do also tend to have a wider kind of sphere of influence. And that's something that maybe people don't think about or, you know, as they're building a, you know, a senior technical role is, you know, you don't necessarily need to manage people, but you're probably going to end up mentoring more junior people. And a lot of those skills are quite similar, but maybe even, uh, you know, more tightly aligned with the actual work that they're doing. You become a subject matter expert and people from other teams, other parts of the business will, you know, seek out your input, um, seek out your expertise. And that's a really good way to kind of add value across the organization. It also requires some of the skills of teamwork, communication, um, you know, sometimes delegating work to other people that cross over with with management. So, you know, there's some parallels and it's possible to, I think, move back and forth between management roles and IC work or, you know, take on a management role later if you're not sure. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or. Um, but, you know, by all means, if you love what you, you do and you, you know, love fingers on keyboards, like, stick with it and 
make the organization around you recognize that that's the unique value you have to bring to the table. Yeah, th those are really great. Uh, really, at the end, it's the impact, no matter your manager or your you know, technical IC that you bring to the organization, to the business, um, and the rest of the you know, come, come or follow on that. So really depends on what you would like to do and which path you will go down. And more and more company and you know, started to creating more very senior uh, IC positions as well. So it's really um, I guess, you know, using your words, okay, it's follow your passion and follow your heart. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's not a linear that uh, you have to always keep in one uh, role and you can, you know, definitely back forth and explore. And it's all learning opportunity for, for us. So that's great. Uh, we have a lot of great discussions about our career journey, uh, career recommendations. So I want to create, uh, you know, uh, switch gear a little bit. Um, so is, this question is a little bit personal. Um, so Kathy and Aaron, what do you do to depress, uh, distress from work? Like what's your hobby uh, or, you know, during the past time to help you feel balanced, uh, not too stressful from, you know, all the work that uh, we're, we're dealing with? All right, let's 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 let me give this a try. So for me, uh, there is a difference between, you know, before pa the pandemic and after the pandemic. I'm trying to figure out how to answer this question. Now what I do uh, regularly this uh, is to go for short hikes, like four or five mile hikes uh, every weekend, Saturday and Sunday. I'll go both days. Doesn't matter whatever else is going on. I'll figure out some time to do that. It's it's. Uh, it started out as, you know, during the pandemic, this was one of the things that you could do that had less risk, obviously, in terms of, you know, going outside and just getting out of the house was a big deal for me. And I wanted to just, uh, you know, certainly have create that time and have that uh, basically uh, time outside of the house. And it became a thing. I still do it. And in fact, interestingly, um, my husband and I, we end up um, listening to books on the walks. Funny story, actually, we were listening to this one book uh, on the way to a walk one day, which was um, Breathe. Uh, and it was all about like, you know, how art of breathing. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you're on a walk, you cannot be breathing through your nose and talking at the same time. It turned out to be very difficult, so we decided why don't we just listen to this book since we've stopped talking while trying to breathe through our noses. Um, and it became a thing. So now that I look forward to that time uh, where you know I'm having some physical exercise, which really makes me feel good, and at the same time listening to a book, which you know, reading has been something that was adversely impacted during the pandemic for me in the sense that, you know, when I'm at home, uh, just sitting at home and reading a book ended up being something I couldn't do for a while. Uh, but, you know, this was a way to get back to uh, get back to it. And I also sometimes like cooking, but, you know, I can't say that I always do it, but it is one of the other things that really <laughs> helps me feel like I've done something productive outside of work too. That's great. Erin, any most recent book that you listened, you would recommend to this community? Okay, so the uh, just the, the book that we just finished is, uh, I should also tell you the I read nonfiction. I, I listen to nonfiction. I read fiction. So the nonfiction book that we just finished is Sabina I forgot her last name, Hoff something. Uh, she's a physicist. It was about existential physics. <laughs> I recommend it to anyone who is interested in 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 you know quantum uh, physics and in just in general. Uh, if you're interested in this area, I, I highly recommend it. There are other books that I found maybe much more illuminating, but I like Sabina's way of uh, describing things. On the fiction side, uh, I am currently reading Vegetarian. I don't know if others have read it or not. It's a short no you know, novel. It's kind of interesting. I haven't finished it yet, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. That's cool. Yeah, we should exchange our audiobook list because I'm also a big fan of audiobook, uh, you know, listening to a lot of audiobook when I run. Uh, that's kind of my 
uh, meditation as well. And I love, um, you know, biography as well, nonfiction. But so, okay, that's all my to do. Uh, Kathy, what about you? How do you de stress from work? Yeah, I also like to get outside and do some exercise. So I like to um, cycle a lot. I live fairly close to um, the ocean and the beach. So, you know, when I'm just, you know, up to here, just getting out, I'm not, I'm not terribly fast, I'm not terribly good. Um, just getting out for a ride and, you know, fresh air and seeing the ocean um, just kind of helps clear my mind. Um, I also like to swim and pools were closed for quite a long time during the pandemic. So now I remind myself whenever I'm kind of standing on the edge and debating whether I should jump into the cold water, you know, what a privilege it is to just have the, the pool open. So, you know, there's something about just sticking your head under the water and, <laughs> and going um, really helps to just kind of clear ideas out and, and think and relax. Um, and then I, almost always read a little bit before I go to bed and use that as a kind of transition point uh, between the day and, you know, and, and getting off to sleep. So I'm a, a fairly big reader as well. That's cool. Yeah. I think we have a time maybe for one or two pre-submit questions so uh, we can quickly go through those and then open the floor for some of the last question. Uh, this is actually one of the very tactical questions. Um, people are asking, what's your go-to questions <laughs> during the one when sync with your manager or other leaders? Any tips that you can uh, share that, you know, help our community member to impress their manager or their leaders? Who would like to take off first? I, I can, I can go. I've, I've got a couple of questions. Um, if I don't have, if I run out of things, I always ask, you know, what's going on at the more senior levels that um, might be relevant to me. What are people thinking about? What are the, you know, the concerns or the opportunities or the hot button topics? What was the last management team discussion about, you know, to the extent they can share and, you know, trying to listen in for ways that maybe my team um, fits into that or if there's some way that I can contribute. So that's, that's the one sort of like, what's the context? What's the big picture? Um, and then the other one is, you know, how can I help you with the project? How can I help you be successful? Is there data that you need? Um, you know, I've found that when you help your manager be successful, they help you be successful. So it's kind of a way of, you know, also for anybody who is a manager, it's really stressful and people come to you with their problems and concerns all day long and you rarely get a chance to, um, you know, unburden yourself. So giving your manager a chance to let you know what's on their mind or what challenges they have or, you know, what you might be able to help with, um, I think is a really good way to kind of build that relationship and rapport with them. That's wonderful. Good, good points. I don't think I have go to questions myself, to be honest. I mean, I'm generally very context aware. So the questions are almost always, um, you know, depending on the situation, the questions that I you know, ask would be different, but I do think what Kathy said about, you know, uh, asking how you could be helping or, you know, what else is happening. <laughs> These are important things to be aware of. And again, especially if, you know, you've already covered everything else that you want to cover. One of the questions I get most frequently now, and I feel this is because of the coaching uh, training that we all took, uh, I think the whole company is what's on top of your mind. To be honest, I don't know yet uh, whether I like this question or not, but you know, I think if you don't know how to approach something others are doing. Um, I don't know if, if, if I ask this to my manager, <laughs> whether it would be necessarily, um, uh, uh, a good one or not, but I, it is. You should not be afraid to ask these type of questions. I think it's 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 perfectly fine to ask about what's going on. Those are good uh, suggestions and advice. Um, one last question that we uh, got is actually related to culture. Uh, what's your take on allyship, and how do you approach finding sponsors in your team and organization? I think a lot of us are kind of struggling. You know. Uh, between sponsors and also mentors. 
I know that a lot of members actually asking the question, uh, which finding the sponsors is probably harder than funding the organization, uh, you know, uh, sorry, funding the mentor in the organization. And how do you approach this? Um, maybe Kathy, you can start. Sure. Um, this is a good question, and I think it's something I've always struggled with a bit and I, I'll honestly say I've never had a lot of good luck just walking up to someone and saying will you be my mentor will you be my sponsor um I've ended up with people who play those roles but much more organically um relationships that developed over time some uh people who were managers in the past that I just keep in touch with um you know, it, it tends to be a lot, I don't know, I found it to be a lot fuzzier than the just cut and dried advice of you need mentors and you need sponsors. Um, one thing I would say that I have done with that in mind is try to intentionally play that role for other people um, and, you know, notice who might need, you know, um, input, advice, who uh, you know, maybe who isn't necessarily directly on my team, but would benefit from, you know, somebody else to bounce ideas off of. Um, I will also say that, uh, you know, forming connections with everybody around you is not necessarily a bad idea. Um, the people who are today, you know, entry level or junior or just getting started in their careers, you blink and all of a sudden they will be the senior people who are leading things. And the, you know, the small efforts that you make to get to know them, to help them out, to uh, point them in the right direction, do tend to come back and, and pay benefits, you know, maybe more kind of horizontally, not necessarily vertically. Um, so I, you know, I try to think about paying it forward, um, try to stay in touch with people that I've enjoyed working with in the past, um, you know, have some confidence that it will work out. Um, but I, I haven't just marched up to people <laughs> and said, you're my sponsor now and found that to be super effective. So I'll say a few things, and I also don't know if there exists a single mechanism that just uh, works for everyone. I mean, we tried different things, and when I say we, I mean my larger organization, actually, for those of you who may know Rukmi, uh, she's tried a bunch of different things, or with her, we've tried a bunch of, you know, different ways of doing this. You know, we've tried to run sort of mentorship matching type of programs before. We haven't tried doing sponsorship matching uh, programs, but typically what uh, we try to do is if there are those who have raised an interest that they would like to have a mentor or a sponsor with certain, you know, characteristics or if, you know, in our teams we hear people say, hey, I would like to be mentored by this person or could this person be, you know, my sponsor. These things we bubble up and discuss, um, you know, within the uh, group that gets these type of, you know, that gets approached most of the time to see, you know, can we, how can we do this? And uh, if one person doesn't work out, can, can we come up with alternatives? I would say finding uh, mentors or allies for myself, I am, like Kathy said, for me, for myself, this is more organic. Anyway, I... As I said before, it's really important for me that I have a support system. <laughs> I have a support system at home. I have a support system at work and my support system at work is both my team and, you know, people above me, around me. We kind of work as a almost like a family unit. I mean, I'm not saying work should be like that for everyone, but this is the way kind of, you know, I, I operate. So it's never been personally for me a case where oh, I, you know, want to find a mentor or a, or a sponsor or an ally for that matter. Um, but I am also not saying we should not try to do this in a more organized fashion. It would be good to find some kind of a structure that, you know, actually uh, allows us to match people. I just don't know of one that works well, except for these cases where people have ideas and, you know, we they discuss it with either their 
managers or the people that they already feel close to or their mentors and these get bubbled up and you know again we uh, we try to figure out the best match in these cases i've also seen in my team actually uh, uh folks who are uh maybe not entirely new but you know at senior uh levels um who are actually trying to run uh, with these type of ideas on their own and i see them actually be more successful with this like what i mean is they do go approach their other colleagues with respect or hey how about we give this a try like it doesn't always need to be someone necessarily you know more senior than you either especially with allyship i, I don't see it uh, you know that way so uh, but what i would suggest perhaps to people who are looking for allies or mentors or sponsors is certainly discuss it with you know, either your managers and if you don't have that kind of a relationship with your direct manager, doesn't need to be your manager who you discuss this with, but discuss it with a few people who you can have this conversation with and you will get suggestions. Yeah, those those are really great. Uh, I think that both of you touched that, you know, uh, the mentorship and, and sponsorship is more kind of organ organically grow. And also I think for me, at least from my experience, once you build that connection, it really depends on you to continue nurturing that relationship and also, you know, uh, grow your network through that. Uh, so a lot is depending on how we do it, right? And uh, how we nurturing that mentorship and, uh, um, you know, sponsorship uh, down to the road. So that's great. Um, I think we have actually quite a lot of great questions from our live audience. So, uh, Xi Jing, I'm handing over to you uh, to maybe ask those Erin and Kathy those questions. Thank you. Thank you, three of you. Thank you so much. It's a lot of great insight and also some of delightful fun facts that learning from uh, all of you. So we do have a lot of questions, and since we are in the allyship sponsorship um, kind of topics, there are two questions actually re uh, really uh, related to that. One is in terms of handling some difficulties. Um, how come someone uh, to improve the situation if the manager, your direct manager, does not give you the support in your career? Um, so that's one of the questions that we have for, for now. And I uh, would like to hear a little more, a little bit more uh, guidance from three of you. All right, I, I can start on this one. First thing I'll say is that, you know, one suggestion I would have at least for people is to try to have a conversation with their managers, even if they feel like they're not getting the support to give this feedback to your manager. I mean, I'm not saying this should be the first thing you do, but you know, managers don't always have the answers and most of the time, you know, they're just like you, you know, they may need the feedback too. If they don't know what you need, you know, they may be also at a loss. And sometimes again, people may just not necessarily see the things that you may think are obvious. So best is my suggestion always is, you know, try to be open and, you know, uh, give people the feedback on what they can improve. You know, of course, you know, there's a way to do that, which would be uh, maybe if if you are not feeling comfortable at all talking to your manager about it, as we discussed, you know, mentors, sponsors, uh, you know, these people could give you guidance in terms of how to navigate your specific scenario. Second thing I would say is that you also have skips. I mean, in our organization, at least we we generally are a very accessible, I would say, uh, you know, organization in terms of leaders. It's uh, if someone is having you know difficulties with me, I would certainly, and if for whatever reason, if I'm not getting it, or if you know they're not able to have a conversation with me, I would certainly hope that they would go to my manager <laughs> and actually discuss what their situation is, and you know. My manager would certainly be able to help them with uh, uh, with with the particular situation and also figure out how to give me that feedback so I can actually do something about it. Right? I would utilize both of these, um, uh, not just mentors and uh, sponsors, but also your skip managers and perhaps even your managers. You know, again, peers. This may depend on the situation a little bit, but you know, try to give this feedback. Everybody needs feedback. 
Yeah, I would agree. I think the, you know, depending on the organization, your direct manager may not be terribly more senior than you are and, and may not have all of the perspective or may have perspective kind of on their path, but not necessarily the variety of paths. Um, and that's fine because your manager probably is also on their own career path and uh, learning how to give you career advice and career growth is is part of their development too. Um, so, but, you know, giving them the feedback, but also seeking out other people, not necessarily just going around them, but you know, seeking out other perspectives so that skip level um, can be great um, to get, you know, the sort of what's the big picture? What are the kinds of things that I need to know or be able to do? Or, you know, how does the, uh, you know, sort of broad timing landscape look? I mean, something I've, I've seen people that I've managed have a hard time kind of digesting is, you know, yeah, you got a promotion. You're, you're typically going to be in this role for two or three or five years before the next promotion or, or whatever. And some people, you know, you sort of need to, to hear that message. Um, but, you know, also keep in mind, there's a lot of different potential career paths sort of either kind of vertically up one chain of command or uh, moving around horizontally to get exposure to different sorts of areas. It is going to be different by person and what you think you want to do. So trying to make it a two-way street around, you know, please give me guidance on career growth, but also, you know, give that information back of here's where I'd like to go or here are some things I would like to do or um, I'm just lost. Can you help me understand kind of some menu of options so that I can go back and think about it? That can be uh, a productive way of continuing that conversation with your manager or your skip level um, or some of the folks who are their peers. Yeah, maybe I just add a couple of more points. So one is the, um, at the beginning point to build that to trust relationship with your manager because you guys are, you know, interact with each other day to day. Um, and the second one is related to the mentor uh, mentorship. Um, I think it's always great to have you know some mentors both within the organization and outside of the organization uh, because within organization you can you know the mentors can get more of a context and knowing more of you know the inside the stories of that and give you some advice. But outside of organization mentors, they are more kind of objective, and you can actually do a more of a objective case study or scenario, you know, an, uh, analysis with them. Uh, so those are actually really valuable, at least for me. And again, you know, you needed to nurturing those mentorship and also relationship um, down the road for sure. Thank you, three of you, uh, three of you. I think it's really important and a great insight when we handling this uh, situation. And you also kind of, uh, you, all of you touch points in terms of have a communication, have a transparent feedback with your manager in the command of the trend, as well as uh, seeking the mentorship and uh, sponsorship. Uh, talking about the sponsorship, there's another question that's, uh, all of you touch on how uh, uh, to look for the sponsorship, but from the sponsor who someone look for a sponsorship from you, what are the considerations that you would uh, take in and to prove and then willing to provide the sponsorship to the uh, to the requesters? Maybe start from Aaron. Yeah, so I'm thinking of the request that I got. I think there is, I was just trying to see is there in case where I said, you know, no to, uh, no. <laughs> so uh, perhaps I'm not very, you know, uh, picky or maybe perhaps already the people who are asking for is, you know, they are thinking very hard. No, but what I would say is that, of course, you know, one thing is what is it that uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this this person is looking for uh, for this sponsorship. What is it that they are they need, and can I actually provide that need? And if I do, I really believe that I can actually. Uh, I am the best person that I know of, at least uh, for that person. This is important for me. I guess not. I don't assume that I am necessarily uh, the best person for everyone who thinks I might be a good sponsor for them. I guess this is one important thing. I mean, as I said, I don't think I've ever gotten to a place where I felt like, oh, I can't do this right now. But I would also say that just be aware 
the other people also have, and I see that uh, a few people are asking about work and life balance and all that, uh, which we haven't gotten into, but there is limited time after all. And the sponsor, obviously, you know, there are some responsibilities you have. You are committing basically your uh, time, energy to uh, to actually satisfy some need. If a person feels like they cannot do justice to that right now, just, you know, it could happen. Don't be offended. It is not really because, you know, um, this person you wanted to be your sponsor doesn't want to be your sponsor, but it may just not work out for them. But then again, personally, I I feel and I what I see mostly around me is that people really try to make the time and uh, but it is a commitment. So you know, if you feel like you cannot satisfy that commitment, you know, it would be the right thing to say maybe you know, no to or recommend other uh, alternatives in, in, in those scenarios. Yeah, I think one other thing I would add is, you know, when I think about sponsorship specifically, it usually, or I think of it as implying some kind of um, endorsement, kind of active promotion, or not promotion in the title sense, but actively um, promoting the person or the person's work to other people. So for me, I need to about their track record. I know enough to actually, you know, kind of speak intelligently and with credibility um, because, you know, when I'm endorsing somebody else, I'm also putting myself on the line. So I want to make sure that there's a good fit there. And so, you know, for various reasons between time or, you know, I, I just don't really know enough about that person's work to be the right person to do that. Um, I might say no, but you know, usually more inclined to be open minded and see if there's a way I can help the other person. Yeah, and I think for me, mostly um, I got a lot of requests for uh, mentorship. Um, I usually to be very upfront. Uh, I will tell them, you know, uh, let's try six months. And, you know, I also have the expectations to my uh, mentees as well. And, uh, you know, I would like to uh, at least uh, be, um, you know, informed before the uh, discussion uh, what are the topics, you know, we would like to discuss so I can really prepare and also provide a high quality of uh, mentorship to those people. And also I would like to see actions follow through. You know, if I provide some suggestions that some mentees acknowledge it but never follow through, uh, that would be also a red flag to me maybe after six months, you know. <laughs> just to be very honest, I probably were just suggested to uh, end our uh, mentorship. So I think, you know, as uh, both of Aaron and Kathy said, everyone's super busy. Uh, I want to, you know, make the best use of the time for both of us. And also, I think I view mentorship is not as just one way, and there's a lot of reverse mentorship. I actually learned quite a lot from my mentees, so uh, I'm willing to take my time and learning from them. And uh, you know, at the same time, I think everyone should be you know prepared and also uh, really uh, you know nurturing the relationship. Um, she didn't hear muted actually. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate all the answers. And I think that all of you actually also touch mentor mentorship, the really, and uh, the allyship also actually it's a time investment as well. So the one last question uh, that from the audience is how three of you strike the balance between the work and the life, given so much going on in your own life and careers as well? So how about we started with Yen this time? Oh, OK, um, I have on my way to distress myself. I think as uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, I do run in the morning uh, and I listen to audiobook. Uh, that's the time that I'm actually, uh, you know, be myself. Uh, and you know, it's quiet, uh, it's colder in the morning, no distractions. So that's kind of really helped me to start the day. Um, I do have a two young kids and, you know, they have a lot of activities, um, but I also want to make sure, uh, you know, I set the right expectations with them, what things that they should do by themselves and what things that I can help them. 
Um, and my husband is actually also in technology company, and uh, he is actually a great partner. We share a lot of uh, you know workload uh, at home by ourselves. Uh, and you know he actually really helpful. You know laundry is just actually all by him. <laughs> so that frees me some of the time. I think you know as all of you said, it, it's really a balance, and there's no right or wrong. And really trying to find the right uh, or the balance the way for you and for your family. So, yeah, we'd love to hear Erin and uh, Kathy's, uh, you know, insights and best practice. <laughs> So yeah, I can I can go next. I <laughs> I'm trying to see how to explain this. I don't have a fixed, you know, day, which is you know, work is from this time to that time, and then after that it's you know, family time. That's not the way I um, I do things. Uh, work and life is a little bit mixed for me in terms of boundary. But that doesn't mean I don't allocate any time for life. I have some routines like uh, Jan says she runs in, runs in the morning. I don't run in the morning, but I do want to have, you know, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes before I start the day with no meetings. You know, this is to for me, it's a good way to start the day. Uh, and then every night um i will have dinner with family <laughs> so that's one thing after dinner i'll go back to meetings maybe uh but you know dinner time i'm not in front of the laptop i'm not checking my phone and like i said you know these you know maybe the hike again another time where i'm not looking at that phone uh but i think it's different for everyone like it, the same thing is not going to work for everyone you need to actually figure out what is the thing that works for you and i will also say that it's it's also not always the same all the time some months you know i'll be just spending a lot more time on one than the other and that's also okay and you know you have to have the rest of your support system you know figured out for that too like Anne said at home she has great support from uh, you know her husband i have great support from you know my partner at home too like all of these things do matter but I do find it to be very useful to have these times, some small routine. It doesn't need to take too much time to kind of be like this, you know, period where I'm going to reset. I need that. I feel like I need that. And what you need might be different, uh, but you do need to, you know, at least feel one that you ha you should do it. <laughs> you don't need anybody's, you know, basically permission to take time for yourself or your family. You just need to figure out the, you know, the rhythm that works for you. Yeah, totally agree. So I would say I have learned to kind of both embrace the chaos and then lean on the support network. So I have three kids. They are a little less than two years apart. So I had one and then I had twins uh, kind of run on top of each other. So um, just a lot of chaos introduced into my life kind of all at once. It was it was very hard um, when I was, you know, starting out as a parent and I love my job. I love working. You know, I was never going to stay home. So, uh, but, you know, coming home to three screaming kids every day. Uh, you know, had its challenges. They missed me. They wanted to spend time with me. Um, you know, feeling pulled in a lot of different directions all the time. It's gotten better as they've gotten older, but, you know, it never kind of ends this sort of feeling like I really want to do my job really well. And I also want to, you know, be a really good parent. Um, so in there that, you know, finding space for yourself and it's OK to say I need to go do my workout. I need some quiet time to read, I need a nap, um, and, and you know, kind of then relying on your support network, whether it's your uh, your partner or my mom moved out close to us, and that's been fantastic. I've had, you know, even like going to get my hair done uh, or getting a massage and just having a person who's like taking care of you for an hour um, really kind of puts a new a new lens on those sorts of things and, and you know, recognizing that you know, we have a community. Um, there are other people even at work who are also parents. And, you know, if if you're a parent or thinking about it, like parents love talking about parenting. So, uh, you know, and there's someone who's been through the same thing as you would ever crazy thing is going on. <laughs> there's, there's
there's someone else who can, you know, kind of share a story and share a laugh about it. And I think that's been a big, big learning process and a big part of, um, you know, figuring out how to kind of evolve that, that, you know, it's never quite balanced, but, you know, I think sanity, <laughs> striving for sanity um, is maybe, maybe good enough. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, they actually, when we are talking about life and work, actually, some of principle actually works in both ways. The efficiency of the time management, having a supporting team at home or at work, and also uh, a little bit of the time management, peer management, so that make our, all of our life much easier. Um, thank you all so much. I think we are uh, at the kind of end of our section and uh, any of the last uh, closing remark from three of you? Um, I have a three very short uh, one. Always be curious, uh, always thinking for learning opportunities and also take care of yourself first. So that's the three. I like the third one the best <laughs> for yourself first. Like it's it's very important. You can't take care of anyone else if you're not taking care of yourself. So I like that one, that one quite a bit. Yeah. Um. I think you know we covered most of it. Like I think just be open in general is again if we are trying to give advice and I don't claim that I have good advice, but like that would be the one thing. Uh, I also do want to acknowledge that there was one question for me on hiring. I'll try to get back to the person who asked that question. I'll try to get that information from you, Xi Jing, later on. But it's a very good question that was asked about hiring, which relates to diversity as well. And I'll touch on it later. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. To say, you know, again, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really, you know, fun and quite an honor to uh, share my stories and, you know, one, feel like people find them interesting <laughs> and, and two, that they might be helpful, you know, take care of yourself and, uh, you know, try to find the sparks of things that are exciting for you. I mean, data, technology, there's just, it's such an exciting field. So much is changing. Uh, it'll continue to change, you know, like, that's pretty inspiring to keep us going every day. It can get daunting, um, but find those moments to to refresh and, and get back on track and it'll be worth it. Perfect. Thank you again, all of you. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to thank everyone for uh, uh, taking the time, uh, recharging and also listening to this conversation. Um, at the end, I um, uh, just wanted to also mention a few housekeeping. Uh, please provide your feedback so help us to uh, continue to improve for any of the future events and stay connected with the community. Please join our team's channel. And uh, lastly, I wanted to thank Mary Hu and How I, who also co-lead the community. Uh, also, Adam uh, Blackton, the uh, Microsoft community, that uh, long-term sponsorship and uh, allyship. And finally, our media team for the uh, technical and media support. All right, have a great day and uh, see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.